afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to the York Festival of Ideas for muggles and for magical folk alike. Um, my name's Annie Hodgson. I'm a science communicator from the chemistry department at the University of York. Um, you might have encountered me at previous festivals, perhaps running a potions class in my wizarding guise. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, I have a few technical notes. If you are watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen, it's probably at the bottom. This is available throughout the event, so questions can be asked at any time. Should you have technical issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link that you were sent. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it again later. Subtitles are available in this event. To turn these on or off, you can use the CC Live transcript button, which is also at the bottom of your screen somewhere. Um, and so hopefully all the technological, technological bits will go smoothly for you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Roger Highfield is the science director at the Science Museum Group, which includes the National Rail Railway Museum here in York. He is a member of the UK's Medical Research Council and a visiting professor at the Dunn School, University of Oxford, and, a department of, and the Department of Chemistry at UCL. Uh, he studied chemistry at the University of Oxford and was the first person to bounce a neutron off a soap bubble which kind of begs the question, why? Anyway, uh, Roger was the science editor of the Daily Telegraph for two decades and the editor of New Scientist between 2008 and 2011. Uh, he's written or co-authored a number of popular science books, including the critically acclaimed The Physics of Christmas and most recently, The Dance of Life, Symmetry Cells and How to Become a Human. The topic of today's talk is drawn from Roger's book, The Science of Harry Potter, which I have a copy of, a very well-thumbed copy of mine, which takes us on a grand tour of muddled scientific principles and theories from quantum mechanics to molecular biology in order to explain the magic of the wizarding world. And so over to you, Roger. I'm looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much, Annie. And, um... It's a huge honor and pleasure to be here at the York Festival Ideas, not least because as you say, I work closely with a brilliant team at the National Railway Museum in York and they've seen more steam locomotives than platform nine and three quarters. Now, I don't have to tell you that Pottermania is um, a global phenomenon. I mean, here's me at the world's first um, grown up symposium devoted to Harry Potter called Nimbus 2003 in Florida. And I must admit, I felt a bit out of place as the one person in a suit among 500 uh, young people, mostly uh, women who discuss, they were there to discuss Harry Potter uh, online. They were, they were from online um, slash slight site communities. Um, and there they would kind of reinvent the Harry Potter books in all sorts of different ways. You know, So they pretend if Harry and Hermione fell in love, or even if Harry and Draco uh, were secretly, uh, you know, uh, infatuated with each other. So I found the whole Harry Potter scene, uh, the books themselves and so on, a hoot. And, um, you know, it's just a brilliant way to explore all sorts of science. So, um, you know, let, let's start dipping into um, one of the more exotic bits of science from, the, from my rather daft book. Um, and let's start off with the griffin. So, you know, Harry's house was, of course, Gryffindor, and that means golden griffin. Uh, griffins are used as guards in the Harry Potter books. Uh, if you go to Dumbledore's office, his knocker is a griffin. So what exactly is a griffin? Well, it's a, it's a creature with a, a beak and wing of an eagle, four feet and bird's claws. And it's fascinating. You can actually trace the origins of this mythical beast. Um, and this is work done by the historian Adrian Mayer, who specializes in folk science and how pre-scientific cultures interpreted the world and how this laid the foundation of many myths. And, you know, what if monstrous creatures once roamed the earth in the very first, first very places where these legends first arose? And this is the kind of arresting and original theme that Adrian Mayer explored in her book, The First Fossil Hunters. 
Now, I think she really convincingly shows that many of the giants and monsters of myth did have a basis in fact. And in fact, you know, the enormous bones of long extinct species that were once abundant in the lands of the Greeks and Romans. And you can imagine if you go back, say, 2000 years ago um, to the hardy gold miners who were seeking their fortunes in the vast Gobi Desert of Central Asia. These, these were the Scythians. They were members of a horse riding people and they controlled much of Central Asia and the Northern Middle East between about 800 BC and AD 200. And looking at travelers tales, Greek authors of the day reported that in the scorching heat of the Gobi uh, in Mongolia, the miners battled not only the blazing sun but also the mighty griffin, this fierce half eagle, half lion hybrid that seemed to guard fantastic treasures of gold. Now, it turns out that in many parts of the world, dinosaur fossils are incredible, incredibly rare and hard to find, but not in parts of the Gobi where the, des where the miners were. So for thousands of years, Protoceratops fossils could regularly be seen eroding out of the hillsides. And here is Protoceratops, and you would have seen it prowling around about 80 million years ago in the Gobi Desert. It was a plant eater, so less scary than it might look. It was about the size of a sheep. Um, it had a bony frill, and this could break off to suggest ears. Um, it had a, a beak and five toed feet. And Mayer points out the Greek writers began describing the griffin around 675 BC. And that was exactly the time that the Greeks first made contact with the Scythian nomads. So given the worldview of the day, you would imagine that when they came across these bones in the desert, they would have imagined that these creatures were alive and they were finding the remains of something that, that was still living today. Of course, today, thanks to our rational worldview, we can turn these into the scientific story of evolution. Now, what about the dragons that inhabit Harry Potter's world? And of course, here's the fearsome Hungarian horn tail, which is considered to be one of the most dangerous dragon breeds, if not the most dangerous of all. Could this possibly be real? And of course they can. And Maya actually argues that the Chinese variety of dragons with ears were often inspired by the prehistoric mammals of China and Mongolia. So the classic ancient Chinese text I Ching talks about dragons encountered in the fields. And Maya, along with the UK paleontologist Kenneth Oakley, thinks that dragon ears were inspired by the antlers of fossil deer. And it's possible that all sorts of other dragon sightings might have been inspired by, for example, the discovery of fossilized dinosaur tracks. So the Children's Museum of Indianapolis asked Adrian Mayer to look into a 66 million year old dinosaur with a long muzzle and spiky horns, um, which did sort of conjure up visions of a magical beast. And they decided to call this creature Dra Dracorex Hogwarts. Hogwartsia, funny, hard to get that name out, in order of J.K. Rowling, of course. And according to Mayer, soon Native Americans who found a skull like that of Dracorex might have identified it as what they called Unteki, which is a mythical horned water monster of the South Dakota Badlands, where the fossil was unearthed. Now here's a vase from antiquity. And if you look at the skull on the right, it really does seem to be the remains of some long extinct creature. And the Greeks and Romans were well aware that a different breed of creatures once inhabited their lands because they often came across the fossilized bones of these primeval beings. And they developed sophisticated concepts to explain this fossil evidence, concepts that were expressed in their mythology and their stories. And one last thought on this matter regarding the Chamber of Secrets, um, there we encountered the fearsome basilisk. And it could be that this uh, magical creature was inspired by um, Gigantophis. This is a prehistoric snake, which may have measured more than 10 meters. Um, it lived about 40 million years ago in the Southern Sahara, where Egypt and uh, Algeria are now located. And more recently, there was discovery of 
think 60 million year old fossils in Colombia of another prehistoric giant snake named Titanoboa. And this monster might have been 14 meters long. You know, now by comparison, uh, a modern green anaconda, which is pretty much one of the biggest snakes around, that gets to a measly eight meters. So you can already see the, you know, the origins um, of this amazing um, basilisk. So let's now move on to a problem where my book annoyingly has been overtaken by developments in the muggle world in actually quite a magical way. And I'm talking about invisibility. Um, within his novel, Life, the Universe and Everything, the great Douglas Adams had the explanation for how to make things vanish. They were simply bathed in what he called a SEP field. And what does SEP stand for? It means someone else's problem. Very funny, but not hugely helpful. Now, in nature, if you look around, you can find all sorts of ways to be invisible. Cuttlefish use color change cells in their skin called chromatophores. And I guess the Hogwarts squid uses this form of invisibility. And this kind of what's called adaptive camouflage has been studied by NASA and by defense researchers in the UK. Another approach to invisibility is just to go transparent, as you can see in the case of this glass fish. And scientists have used all kinds of techniques that can make tissues as clear as glass to actually get access to the inner workings of biological systems. But obviously they're really only useful for sort of specimens, not for a living creature. So here's another approach to invisibility carried out by Professor Susumu Tachi of the University of Tokyo. And here you can see they're taking an image of scenery behind this person. It's captured by a camera behind him. A computer calculates the right perspective and translates the captured image so it can be projected on this cloak that he's wearing, which is made of a special reflective, retro-reflective material. So it reflects back the incident light. So they're projecting the scene behind this person actually on him. And that gives you a kind of version of invisibility there. Now, here's another um, way to approach it. We've got Chon Hong Seng from Zhenjiang University showed um, a kind of hexagonal box um, that could make a fish invisible by bending light around the animal. You can just see the fish poking his snout out there. And what it is, it's basically a set of prisms made from high quality optical glass that bend light around any object in the enclosure in which the, uh, the prisms are arrayed. So you can see the weed behind the prisms, but the fish, which is actually in the middle of the prisms, is in fact here they're trying to chase the fish out so you can okay there's the fish so there you can see another form of uh, of invisibility now after my book came out um muggles came up with not one but four different mathematical schemes for invisibility and perhaps the best known came from sir john pendry who works at imperial college it's just a few hundred yards away from where i've got my office and where i've got my treadmill desk. So here's Sir John, and I kind of think of him as the Albus Dumbledore of physics. Now Sir John and others have shown with mathematics how a cloaking device could work in principle by making light waves flow around an object. Think of it like a rock in a stream and the water flows around that rock undisturbed. So let's quickly just gallop through how this form of invisibility uh, works. Now, first of all, bending light is nothing special. You can see it in a mirage. And here's one of Sir John's slides. And you can see how light bending causes a mirage in the bottom right screen. And this commonly occurs on summer days, you know, when you're driving down a road, a baking hot asphalt road, and um, it heats the air directly above it. And that creates a shift in air density levels near the ground. So as the light passes between the different levels, it bends, uh, creating the mirage. Now here's a really spectacular example of a levitating ship. Um, this was taken by David Morris um, near Falmouth in Cornwall. It's called a superior mirage. And there were special atmospheric light bending conditions. Um, it, this actually relied on something called a temperature inversion where there's cold air close to the sea with warmer air above it. 
And because the cold air is denser than warm air, it bends light towards the eyes of someone standing on the ground on the coast, changing how this distant object um, appears. And that's how you get this bizarre and amazing levitating effect. Now, of course, to bend light all the way around an object, you need special optical properties. And all objects or all materials found in nature have what's called a positive refractive index. That's a, a measure of the way that um, electromagnetic waves like light are bent when moving from one medium to another, say from air to water. What you actually need is a negative refractive index in which the light is bent the wrong way as it passes through. And that enables it to work as a, a cloak. Now here's another of Sir John's slides. And what he's talking about here is how to make these negative refractive index materials. Uh, and the way you can make an invisibility cloak is to create what's called a metamaterial. And that's a composite material that you don't encounter in nature. And sometimes you can design them right the way down to the atomic level. And they could hide a person or guide light around say an ugly tower block, which blocks a view. Um, and here you can see uh, again, one of Sir John's images, um, one of his cloaks and light sweeping around an object, uh, rendering it invisible. Now, he actually made a primitive sort of invisibility cloak uh, working with Duke University in the United States. And this is um, uh, a microwave warping metamaterial. It's about as big as a pizza, um, but actually to, and you could actually cloak whatever's inside that, that sort of pizza. Um, to actually get down to the levels of light, you've got to make a, a metamaterial that's got to work on the scale of billionths of a meter. And it needs an array of structures that have got to be smaller than the wavelengths being used. So microwaves are just much bigger than visible light waves. So the pizza size device you can see here, that manipulates light waves um, in the longer microwave band. So they're about from a millimeter up to 30 centimeters long. So you can really physically see the metamaterial structure. But when we view the world through this, uh, this narrow band of electromagnetic radiation that we call visible light, we're going from about 400 billionths of a meter, that's around violet or purple, to 700 billionths, which is deep red light. And by comparison, a human hair is about 100 thousand billionths of a meter across. So we've got to manipulate metamaterials for these tiny length scales if we're going to manipulate light and make it flow around objects. So um, it's quite a tall order, I have to say. Muggle technology is beginning to get there, but to make the invisibility cloak uh, made famous in the Harry Potter books, um, you'd have to deal with very fragile uh, metamaterials, how you make them on a large scale, and how you can make them to bend all uh, light wavelengths. I think that's gonna be a big challenge, but I think we're gonna see some big developments in years to come, or maybe we won't see anything, if you see what I mean. Now, if we whiz over to King's Cross Station, um, the departure point for, for York and for students of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and, and Wizardry, um, you know, we're used to, um, the idea that uh, the Hogwarts Express only departs from platform nine and three quarters. Um, and we poor old muggles have got to put up with platforms nine and 10. And in fact, when JK Rowling was quizzed about why she chose platform nine and 10 in Kings Cross Station, she said that she was actually thinking of Kings, sorry, she was thinking of Euston Station instead, but she mixed them up. But it did beg a very important question. Can we walk through walls? Well, actually it turns out we can using something called a fog screen. And this produces a thin curtain of dry fog that serves as a kind of translucent projection screen. So you can display images that literally float in the air. So here's an old publicity video from a company called Fog Screen. Um, and you can see, there we are, someone's walking through the image. They've got the Mona Lisa projected there. I say, this is an early prototype. So they're actually much uh, better now, but you can you get a sense of how you can if you projected the image of a brick wall there how you could easily walk through that brick wall and create the illusion um, that you were yeah that you were actually walking through a wall anyway I, th I think now it's a good idea to segue from walking through walls to 
ghosts. And I'm going to be straight with you. I believe in ghosts and I can tell you exactly where they come from. And here's where it's the brain. Our brains deceive us all of the time. They're kind of constantly conjuring up phantoms that we mistake for reality. Uh, you know, when you look around you, there's a blind spot at the back of the eye where the optic nerve plugs into the back of the eye. And it's equivalent to about six moons in the sky, but the brain papers this over so you can't actually see it. Um, there's lots of examples of visual illusions where you can sort of see the tricks played by the brain. So here's the Necker cube, one very famous illusion. It seems to flip back and forth between two valid interpretations. You know, each part of the picture is sort of ambiguous by itself, yet the human visual system picks up an interpretation of each part that makes the whole consistent. So these cubes are either seem to come out or go back in again. And they, your brain can't quite make up its mind what the perspective is. Now, here's what's called a peripheral drift illusion of motion. Uh, it was created by Akiyoshi Kitaoka. And although this image is static, if you get close enough, these snakes appear to be moving in circles. And the speed of this perceived motion depends on the frequency of eye movements. Our eyes dart backward, backwards and forwards, and they're called saccades. So when you read you know, the Harry Potter books, you might think that both eyes focus on one part of the text. But in fact, often your right and left eyes focus on different parts of words. Even though you think your eyes are moving smoothly across the text, that's all an illusion created by your brain. In fact, maybe the best known example of uh, the kind of illusion that the brain can uh, pull is called change blindness. Um, there's a wonderful video, um, which I'm sure half of you have seen, uh, called the Invisible uh, Gorilla video, um, which I won't spoil, but it's well worth watching. Um, if you do it in front of a live audience, I've lost count the number of times that people really don't believe that, they've, uh, that they're watching the same video. Uh, but it was done by Dan Simons of the University of Illinois. And he's gathered some really amazing evidence of how you can look at something without really seeing it. And he did this great experiment with Dan Levine at Vanderbilt University in Nashville uh, in Tennessee. And they uh, had a stranger asking people walking across a college campus for directions. And as they were chit-chatting away, two people carrying a wooden door would pass between the stranger and the subjects, just a member of the public who they come across. And once the door passed, half the people they tested failed to notice that they'd swapped the stranger with a man wearing different clothes of a different height and a different build. And this is all down to something called change blindness. And it's because your brain can't perceive and remember all the details of the world around it. It focuses on certain things. So it's very easy to trick the brain. So here's someone I used to work with at the Daily Telegraph, Dr. Davina Bristow, who now works on science documentaries. Um, of course, got this upside down. Um, let's, now here's actually the same image, but you'll notice that actually um, it really is exactly the same image, but her mouth and eyes are the wrong way round as they were in the previous image. And your brain, again, can be tricked because there are specific parts dedicated to face perception, but where you rarely encounter upside down faces in real life. So, um, you know, these parts of the brain always work best with upright faces. So when you're presented with an upside down face, of course, your brain is able to identify different parts of the face, but is not able to perceive the relationship between these parts. So it doesn't really easily spot the distorted face. So your brain fools you all the time, but where do ghosts actually come from? Now, one clue comes from a very common and a very strange phenomenon called sleep paralysis. Um, and it occurs when you feel briefly paralyzed as you're falling asleep or waking up. And it strikes about a third of us um, at least once. I've, I suffered it once, a uh, bizarre experience. And tens of thousands of cases have been studied by a chap called Alan Chain at the University of Waterloo in Canada. And you find that because it's a halfway house between consciousness and dreaming, some people think they report a sensed 
presence. They think there's a spectral figure or ghost or even an elderly person dressed up in old fashioned costume. Um, and you can find when you look through cultures and different legends, there's lots of um, evidence that other cultures have experienced this. So in Newfoundland, sleep paralysis is called old hag because it's, it's linked. The rumor go, or the legend was that, that an, an ugly old woman squat on the chest of a, squatted on the chest of a paralyzed sleeper. Uh, the Chinese call it we are or ghost pressure. Uh, in the West Indies is called Kokma, where a ghost baby bounced on the sleeper's chest and attacked the throat. Um, in ancient Japan, a giant devil was blamed, but it's very clear these are all to do with sleep paralysis. Now, another clue comes from a strange phenomenon called Charles Bonnet syndrome. It's very common among people who've lost their sight. And what they do is they, they end up seeing visual hallucinations. It turns out that when the brain is starved of sufficient information from an eye that's going blind, it begins to compensate with abnormally increased activity and it conjures up hallucinations from the random firing of nerve cells. And Dominic Fitch of the Institute of Psychiatry in London um, has studied these um, hallucinations and he finds fascinatingly they fall into a handful of categories, distorted faces, costume figures, um, all sorts of other bewildering apparitions. A lot of them, 40%, saw figures in costume, Edwardian costume, knights in armor, military uniforms, Napoleonic uniforms, First World War uniforms, and they often wear hats as well. A disembodied or a distorted face of a stranger with staring eyes and prominent teeth is often seen in about half of patients. Sometimes they can only see the outline like a cartoon of a person. And often um, the faces are described as being grotesque, like gargoyles. So he suggests that hallucinations occur when the brain's, uh, a region of the brain, brain called the lateral occipital region alerts us to the possibility that what we're looking at might be a face. So the region detects the face's component features, you know, the eye, the nose, the lips, the chin, but it doesn't actually register where they are. It doesn't really care if a chin's on a forehead or a pair of eyes is under the nose. And I think that's what um, causes these characteristic gargoyle-like distortions is the overemphasis of certain facial features, such as, you know, the prominent staring eyes. And it turns out Charles Bonnet syndrome is named after a Swiss philosopher and writer. He lived about 250 years ago. And he wrote about his grandfather's experiences after he lost his sight, cataract. And he began to see patterns, people, birds, and buildings, which were not really there. In other words, he really could see ghosts. So let's keep moving now through the magical world of J.K. Rowling. Here's Maggie Smith playing Professor McGonagall. And looking at her, there's one question that immediately leaps into your mind. Why do witches and wizards like to wear these hats? And it turns out there's actually quite an ancient link between height and power. You know, if you look just around us in the animal kingdom, you find that larger males are more likely to win fights, are more dominant, and more likely to reproduce. And various studies have shown that taller men enjoy a range of advantages. Uh, there was a study back in the 1940s uh, by psychologists that found that tall salesmen were more successful than their shorter colleagues. Um, when university students were asked to rate the qualities of men of varying heights, they thought that they perceived, obviously, whether this is true or not is neither here nor there, but they perceived that short men were less mature, less secure, less capable. Um, and it, there's quite a strong link between height uh, and a perceived success. And you find that it works the other way around. So people often overestimate the height of high status individuals such as media celebrities. You know, Dustin Hoffman is only five foot five, Madonna's five foot four. Um, Tom Cruise is quite short as well, but we kind of perceive them to be taller. Um, so again, that's our brain at work. Now, our ancestors linked height with power. And because of this, um, they began to augment their height. And this is some extraordinary headgear. It's um, 
a beaten gold hat found the examples found in Germany and in Switzerland as well by archaeologists. And this one dates back about 3000 years. And it really does say, you can imagine if you put this hat on, it would say, I'm a powerful person. Um, now these hats were sometimes intricately embellished with all sorts of astrological symbols that helped them to predict the movement of the sun and the stars. Of course, astrology, I should say, is nonsense. Um, but at that time, there was a big muddle between astronomy and astrology. Um, and they certainly did understand the movement of the sun and the stars. And you can see on this hat, sun and half moon symbols. That seems to be something called the Metonic cycle, where 235 lunar months make up 19 solar years. Um, and we think that these uh, amazing cones were worn as ceremonial hats by Bronze Age oracles, um, some sort of king priest. They were perceived to have supernatural powers because of their ability to predict, um, you know, the correct time of year, whether it's for sowing or planting or for harvesting crops and so on. And, you know, they would have been regarded as lords of time um, who had access to divine knowledge that sort of enabled them to look into the future. And that maybe takes me to the last hat that I'm going to mention, which is, of course, the um, J.K. Rowling sorting hat, um, which can read minds and determines in which house, you know, Slytherin, Gryffindor, whatever, uh, future wizards will reside. Um, it actually turns out we're making great strides when it comes to reading minds with all sorts of scanners. So I think here we've got one uh, mind reading scheme. Uh, I don't know how easily you can see all of that, but it's based on a technique called magnetoencephalography. Um, it relies on detectors called squids, um, which are the most sensitive measuring instrument, instruments known to humankind. Um, when your brain is at work, the individual brain cells, the neurons in the brain, have electrochemical properties. They, rely, they um, result in the flow of charged ions. These are charged uh, atoms, and they generate little electromagnetic fields. And these neuromagnetic signals generated by the brain are extremely small. They're about a billionth of the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. So a magnetoencephalography scanner requires really sensitive sensors to pick up these fields, and they use um, squids, which are superconducting quantum interference devices. They're bathed in a big li liquid helium or bathed in liquid helium in a tank to make them superconducting. And in that way, you can read the mind at work. Now, everyone recognizes this chap, Dobby, the house elf who served the Malfoy family. And in fact, uh, I was very lucky enough uh, to meet um, Dobby in New York many years ago with my wife at the Tribeca Film Festival. Um, in fact, I met David Andrews, who was the animator and special effects uh, specialist from Industrial Light and Magic. And he was the inventor of Dolby from the Harry Potter films. And I can remember talking about the problems that they had with the technology of that day uh, when they showed Dobby bouncing up and down on blankets and sheets that deform uh, on a bed as he jumped up and down, not easy to do uh, with, with the computer wizardry of that day. Um, but there's actually another way to make Dobby, um, not in the heart of the computer, but actually using genetic magic. Now here are some fruit fly mutants, um, which have caused a buzz among geneticists for years, ho ho. Um, and we could create something like Dobby by the power of genetics because fruit flies in particular have helped us understand how the body plan is laid down. You can see these mutants here, and th there are lots of different fruit fly mutants. They've done, they've created some with two sets of wings instead of one, legs instead of antennae. Um, there's one called bicordal, which has no head, not much of a body, and two anuses. You can see a fly here with shrunken wings or curly wings or legs instead of antennae. So, you can, from studying these mutations in the genetic code of fruit flies, and we're quite similar in many respects to fruit flies, you can figure out how to design a creature like Dobby, or indeed Fluffy the three-headed dog, 
because it turns out there's a gene called Cerberus. And um, once you turn off the Cerberus signal, which actually is, is telling the body to make a trunk, you get a head instead. So in that way, you can, by a bit of genetic tinkering, I'm not sure this is a strictly ethical mind, but you can, in theory at least, create a three-headed monster, the kind that the ancient Greeks thought um, guarded the gates of hell. So finally, let's move to the um, uplifting subject of levitation. So we're all used to lots of examples of anti-gravity in these wonderful films. We've got Ron Weasley's Enchanted, Turquoise, Ford Anglia, Hagrid's Flying Motorbike. Um, you can see Harry and his teammate zooming around on flying broomsticks in a Quidditch match. So how do they do it? And there are lots of possibilities. You could have a balloon, I guess, but that would be rather slow and a bit depressing and you could easily see it. Um, rockets would work, but just imagine with those long trailing ropes, huge fire risk. So there's three ways that science has approached um, anti-gravity. Now, one is to look at this very mysterious anti-gravity force in the universe called dark energy. It makes up about 73% of the universe. Um, dark matter, which is a form of gravity we don't really understand, that makes up about 23%. And the atoms that make up the stuff around us are just a measly 4%. And we had all sorts of observational hints that something called dark energy, a kind of anti-gravity effect, existed back in the 1980s when astronomers were trying to understand how clusters of galaxies were formed. And when they started to trace um, the expansion history of the universe, making observations of star births, supernova, they found that the expansion seemed to be speeding up rather than slowing down. Um, uh, here's an image from WMAP, which is a space probe, um, where they could actually deduce properties of the universe. And they found that in 2003, that this accelerated expansion could be explained by dark energy. And just recently, we've had the first dark energy survey. Uh, we've only managed to cover 226 million galaxies over one eighth of the sky. So we've got a, um, a long way to go to get to the bottom of dark energy. But it's, a, it's an intriguing, although a very dilute source of anti-gravity. Um, but I've got to say, though, it's still not really properly understood. So I'm not convinced that's what um, Harry Potter and his chums have manipulated. So here's another approach. Um, this is an artist's impression of uh, a device that was put forward in 1992 by a Russian researcher called Eugenie Podkletnov. And he found that if you took a fast rating, rotating superconductor, that's a material that loses all resistance to electricity if you, you chill it down, it reduces the effects of gravity. Now, since that study, there's been loads of people trying to reproduce Podkletnov's experiment. Um, and in fact, he himself is still working on a way to modify um, the local gravitational field. So could there be some sort of Podkletnov of Kletnov unit in the back of a broomstick? Maybe, but I'm a bit skeptical. Now here's another approach um, called a Levitron. Uh, it's a toy developed by Roy Harrigan. There's me, here's me using it. I used to do this as a live, live demo, but it's very fiddly to get it to work. Um, and basically it's, um, you can see this magnetic top and there's a powerful magnet in the base. Here's my daughter who will be mortified now since she's, um, just finished her finals at Durham to see I'm still using this ancient um, uh, video. But here you can see there's a real anti-gravity effect here. And it's actually, it is a bit of a mystery that it works at all because there, there was a theory by a chap called Earnshaw in 1842 saying that you couldn't balance magnetic fields like this. And it took um, uh, a muggle wizard in the, in the guise of Sir Michael Berry at the University of Bristol um, who finally, after quite a long time, it's only a few years ago, found a proof that Levitron should work. I mean, hilariously, of course, we knew they were because the, the toy came before the theory. Um, and it turns out the anti-gravity force that repels the top from the base is, of course, magnetism. Um, they're magnetized oppositely. 
But it turns out um, that the spinning, the, because the top's spinning, that's what helps keep it stable. And because it's dynamic and not static, and that's what Earnshaw studied back in 1842, um, a slight horizontal or vertical displacement, it just produces a little force pushing the top back towards what's called an equilibrium point. So it stays quite stable. Now, you can think of the spinning electrons in the body as a bit like the Levitron, uh, or indeed in a strawberry like we've got here. And in a magnetic field, the electrons in the atoms rearrange their orbits slightly, creating a small persistent current with an opposite uh, to, with, an, with a field opposite to the external magnetic field. This is called diamagnetism, and strawberries are diamagnetic. We're diamagnetic too, and so we create a magnetic field in opposition to any externally applied magnetic field, and that causes a repulsive effect. Now, um, so Andre Geim uh, in Manchester is perhaps best known for his work on the wonder material graphene. Um, he's well known for being quite playful in science, and he once published a scientific paper that was co-authored by his pet hamster, Tisha. And he levitated Tisha um, and frogs as well using magnetic fields. And Tisha lived to tell the tale. So frogs, like everything around and inside us, are also made up by millions and billions of atoms. Each of these atoms contains electrons. And then again, when they're in that magnetic field, they shift their orbits and you get this oppositional magnetic field and you can actually levitate um, a frog if you can put it in a high, uh, a region of high magnetic field, a high field. So Wingardum Leviosa, and here we go, we should have a video now showing a frog being levitated. It's one small step for a frog, one giant leap for humankind. Um, so that could be a way, perhaps Hogwarts is bathed in a giant magnetic field. Anyway, there are lots of copies of my daft book and in lots of languages. So there you have it, the science of Harry Potter. Uh, any questions? Thank you so much, Roger. That was fascinating. And so lovely to see all the, all the pictures of things actually happening. That was brilliant. We've got some questions that have uh, been sent in from the audience already, but please, if you have got any other questions, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A. Um, we'll start with one which they, they started with a caveat. I guess you may not know the answer to this, but <laughs> I wonder how much JK Rowling knew about the scientific practicalities behind the world she created. I think she, it's very interesting looking at the, the myths and legends that she drew on. So I, th I think she, she did, um, mix in lots of muggle legends and so on but i don't think she was that um you know fixated with the science behind it um and a good thing too because it gave me lots more fun in trying to unravel the mysteries um of wizarding science yeah and yeah yeah if you start thinking about it you start putting yourself with restricting yourself to things that yeah. have already been done. And I hasten to add, I'm not trying to disprove Harry Potter at all, rather like with my, um, my Science of Christmas book, I take it as a solemn uh, fact that these things are real. So how can we explain them and work from that, that way around? So it's really not a debunking of JK Rowling at all. It's an amplification of the wonder of the wizarding world. <laughs> yes, yes. You know it's true, so we have to just work out how it how it's all happened. Um, the next question was that thank you for this. Super interesting. It says, do you have a favorite scientific stroke magic explanation from the series, or one that really blew your mind when you thought it through scientifically? I think the um, the the one that I you know the the it's actually invisibility and Harry's invisibility cloak because I put a lot of effort into trying to explain that uh, using this adaptive camouflage technology. And within a year or two of the book coming out, there were some very serious scientific papers showing that invisibility actually was um, at least in principle possible because of this, you know, manipulating these metamaterials and so on. Um, and actually, um, 
that did blow my mind that 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 they managed to crack that. As I say, achieving it practically is is a difficult thing to do, but there are real metamaterial cloaking devices out there working at certain frequencies. Um, and yeah, I find that extraordinary. I'm going to take um, Chair's prerogative now because I think this links to what you've just been talking about. Because I mean, it must be about I don't know, 20 years since you began writing this book. And in fact, there are only four of the original Harry Potter books that have been published at the point at which your book was right. So, I mean, we know that, as you've just been talking about, science moves on a pace. Um, and so can, um, if you were going to write an addition today, apart from updating a bit in visibility, is there anything else that you would include from a you know, scientific development point of view, and also perhaps from the final three books, which were obviously not included in your original issue. Yeah, I mean, I there, there's uh, well, certainly invisibility is is one of the key ones because there's been so much, so many interesting developments. Um, I think also um, I talked about um, you know making magical creatures with genetic modification. In fact, in the last few years, there's a way to carry out genetic modification in a very surgical way, a method called CRISPR, which really has been a game changer. You know, the um, one of my earlier books looked at um, genetically modifying sheep so they would produce uh, human drugs in their milk. And it was a very random process where the scientists were, and I'm not exaggerating too much, if I say they were just dropping the genes to, to make the drug into the genetic code of the sheep and just hoping that one of them would land up in the right place. Uh, you wind forward to today and they, you can do very precise genetic modifications. But in fact, interestingly, there's been a double whammy because um, whereas we can modify genes um, with much more precision than before, actually, the more we understand about how the genetic code works, the more we realize it, that the the link between the genetic code of a creature and the way it looks and behaves is much more subtle and complicated and interlinked. And there's lots of redundancy than we understood before. So actually, in some ways, it's got much harder to, to, to create magical creatures, I suspect. <laughs> I mean, I, and I, I do think though that, you know, the latter half of my book looks at why we believe in things we do and, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe what one thing, one of the later themes in that, uh, that this constant interplay between um, good and evil, you can see actually in evolutionary game theory models as well. Um, so um, I'd probably predict a resurgence of, a resurgence of dark wizards, actually. Um, but anyway, we're, the series is over now, so we'll never know. <laughs> um. I don't, again, this may be a question you don't, to which you don't know the answer, but this is, are there any research areas that you know were inspired by current scientists having read Harry Potter when they were younger? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I certainly know there's been a big link between um, science fiction and science over many years. I'm, I'm not sure... Although actually, you know, it could be that the invisibility researchers that I suspect did get a bit of help from the fact that people suddenly became very interested in invisibility cloaks. And in fact, if you look at the press coverage that the early work on negative refractive indices and metamaterials got, it was all around Harry Potter. So in a strange way, I, I think Harry Potter did help um, early invisibility research. And I can certainly think of loads of other examples. I mean, just give you two. I once interviewed Jerry Anderson, who created Thunderbirds, and he was convinced that a whole generation of NASA engineers were inspired by Thunderbirds. Um, and if you look at um, the Carl Sagan book, Contact, which was turned into a movie with Jodie Foster, he wanted to um, have interstellar travel and he asked Kip Thorne, who actually won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, to come up with a scheme for using wormholes to travel through space and time. Now, Kip had to come up with some rather 
uh, exotic conditions to create wormholes. But um, that it, it did help trigger some interesting research in, in that area. And in fact, Kip um, was also involved in the, the Chris Nolan movie, Interstellar. And there, the circle moved back to science because the, they, they reproduced a black hole in Interstellar called Gargant Gargantua, I think it was. Um, and the simulations done for the Chris Nolan movie were more advanced than the most advanced scientific simulations. So actually, um, the movie magic helped inspire some new insights into the way real black holes work. So there's all sorts of interesting connections out there. A quick question from Heather, who's very concerned about the levitating frog. Did it survive and were there any long term health effects? <laughs> The levitating frog was fine, absolutely fine. And, and you know, of course, the fact that hamster Tisha, the family pet who was also levitated, not only lived to tell the tale, but actually co-authored a scientific paper in a peer-reviewed journal. I think that says it all. <laughs> absolutely safe. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, very relieved. Um, <laughs> um, we've, we've, oh, yes. We've just, are you able to signpost? people to the, because uh, Amy's wondering about the, the uh, invisibility research, whether you can point her in the right direction so she can do more about it. Oh, um, I'm just wondering where, I mean, I'm sure if you Google invisibility and metamaterials, um, that will, you're, you're bound to find, particularly if you look on, um, you know, Google News or something like that, there's always developments in this field actually. Or in fact, if you uh, if you go to a site called Eureka Alert, which has got press releases from universities, and if you searched for metamaterial invisibility there, you you get a bit of an overview of what's happening. Thank you. Uh, a bit of googling. Um, Harriet's wondering if the time turner can really work. It would be very handy. Ah yes. Now, oh gosh, time is such a great subject. The subject of my first book um, and th there is a problem with time in science I'm not sure we quite got to the bottom of it yet and um, there are some people like the philosopher Julian Barber who thinks that time doesn't exist um, there are other scientists who believe that there might be two dimensions of time I'm still trying to get my head around that Stephen Hawking once tried to ban uh, time travel with what he called the chronology protection conjecture and the reason scientists really hate time travel is because of the grandmother or the grandfather paradox, which is you could go back in time, you could murder one of your grandparents, therefore you wouldn't have existed to go back in time. So once you allow time travel, it undermines causality. Um, but it turns out that um, it's not obviously against the laws of physics. It might be linked with the fact that um, with the exception of the second law of thermodynamics that sort of predicts that everything will go to sort of chaos and ruin. Um, there's not an arrow of time built into, say, Newtonian mechanics and quantum mechanics. They're quite happy for time to run forward or backwards. Um, so they're oblivious to the direction of time. So anyway, it's a great question, and I'm not sure I've given a very comprehensive <laughs> answer. But, um, but for, for the time being, anyway, we haven't banned time travel and it is possible, although the physicists don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while we are talking about things, how things work, um, what about transfiguration? I mean, we know Professor McGonagall is very good at transfiguring herself into a cat and they turn things, you know, made animate objects into inanimate objects. How does it work? Well, I think here again, you know, we've got lots of insights into um, the, the human genetic code and how it turns into the body plan and so on. Um, I think it would be a very painful and risky procedure. <laughs> but we do, in principle, at least, I think in practice, it'd be rather hard, um, understand how to, um, you know, how to play with the, the, the body plan. And of course, you know, we are beginning to um, grow stem cells from people. You know, I could take one of your skin cells. Um, I can genetically modify it by, with a technique developed by this Nobel Prize winner, Yamanaka. I can make it embryonic again, and then I can grow those cells into any kind of tissue. Um, so we can do all sorts of interesting things now. 
to, to do it in real time in a matter of seconds, that does seem pretty magical to me, but it's but the, I can sort of see the glimmer of a way that you might be able to do it. Yes. <laughs> I, was just try, I was just thinking we've probably got time for one last quick question. And I'm just, oh, we'll go with how do we imagine Wong's work from Francesca? Do you know, I, that is such a good question because um, it's, you, you can, how the wand itself works is something that I'm afraid I've never quite managed to get to um, the bottom of. Um, I'm certainly, I, you know, I can talk about what, what, what wands do. So let's take Obliviate. You know, you're forgetting things. We know that memory is to do with laying down connections in the brain. In fact, your brain's, as we, as you listen to me, is changing connections and, and absorbing information about its surroundings. So you can see how you could change those connections in the brain to, to wipe out a memory or even create a memory. But how the wand exactly does that, hmm, that's still a big mystery for me. <laughs> as long as you don't give us the obliviate charm now, because we'd all forget all your wonderful talk, which would be a great shame. Um, I must apologize to all those people who questions we've not managed to get to, but thank you ever so much for all these fascinating questions that you have put into the Q and A. Um, sorry, we couldn't get Great to more. Great questions. Yeah, so some really excellent questions. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Roger, for a really fascinating talk and both engaging with both the magical and the scientific world. And um, I think one of the questions was, you know, do we really want to take away all of the mystery by explaining things? And I, I yeah, I think it's nice to have things. I think science amplifies the wonder, actually. I, I gosh, if, if I'd be mortified at the thought that my book that takes away the, the mystery. There's still plenty more mystery out there, don't worry. <laughs> yes, so yes, so, so there's pl plenty more, and we keep discovering more th things that are even more amazing than you know people have dreamed up in science fiction, so there's still loads to come. Um, that was the book, The, the Science of Harry Potter. Uh, I've discovered that Roger has a, a rather nice website which talks about all his various books and his articles he's written. I don't know whether uh, we can pop in the chat the link to that if anybody else would like to go and have a look at that. So as well as thanking Roger for his amazing talk, I'd also like to thank uh, everybody from the Festival of Ideas who made this and other events in the Festival of Ideas prop possible. Um, they beaver away in the background, never getting any credit. There are dedicated house elves who make sure that everything runs without a hitch. So thank you very much. You know who you are behind the scenes. Oh, yes, I can see that it's in the chat now if anybody would like to click on that link to Roger's website. Um, the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the watch again section of the festival website after the 20th of June, you've got to wait. Uh, you will be contacted by email when the video is available. So if you want to see that frog levitating again, you can do. Um, we hope that you'll continue to be engaged with the Festival of Ideas, the York Festival Ideas, of course. Um, and you can check out our website and that's probably going to appear in the chat as well, yorkfestivalofideas.com. Uh, for full details of all the events in the festival programme, you can find them on that website. Uh, we'd also love to hear your thoughts on these events and continue the conversation using the hashtag York Ideas. So thanks ever so much to everybody for joining in this magical adventure this afternoon. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. Thank you ever so much for joining in and thank you again, Roger, and to Katie, who I know was magically changing your slides. <laughs>